Well, um, welcome to Science Sundays. This is actually a series of lectures that are uh, hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences. And the general idea, as many of you know, is to use these lectures to host experts in various fields and, in fact, disseminate knowledge of, of various topics ranging from uh, technology to sciences and even the arts. And um, uh, the, um, I am, the, I represent the Center for RNA Biology. By the way, Science Sunday is, is actually sponsored by eight different centers. And I represent the Center for RNA Biology, which is the, the perhaps the most important center in the university. <laughs> <laughs> An exaggeration that uh, always sounds like music to my ears. And uh, my name is Juan Alfonso. I'm a, I'm an arts and science distinguished professor and the current director of the center. For those of you who have been living under a rock and don't know what RNA is, RNA is actually probably the most important molecule in life. And its importance goes to modern times where we actually use RNA for modern technologies in the hospital bed or getting there, like the new and latest developments in genome editing or the way to the origins of life because for many of us, it is clear that life on Earth, in fact, started with RNA. So that's what the center studies. And today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a Professor Michael Gray. Michael Gray is a professor emeritus in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada. So Michael has, um, been, the has been the recipient of many honors and awards. Of course, I will not list them all. But um, he has been really probably one, in my opinion, one of the clearest thinkers in, and drivers of what we know about the origin of mitochondria, something that we'll expand on today, and even the origin of eukaryotes themselves, the group of organisms that includes human beings. So we are all going to be part of this. And, uh, and finally, I will, Michael is actually is currently a professor emeritus, but he has been a a elected member of the Royal Society of Canada and an and elect, elected fellow of the American Academy for Microbiology. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Gray. <clears throat> Can you give me a heads up? I guess I'm live, so um, thank you very much, Juan, for that introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers for the invitation, and I'm honored to be here today. I hope I can convey to you some of the excitement and enthusiasm about this topic that has engaged me for um, pretty much all of my career, which is getting on towards 50 years now, so there's going to be a little bit of history here. I understand it's a somewhat diverse audience, so I will, uh, as I go through, try and explain a few terms and concepts that maybe not everybody is familiar with. Okay, so this is the uh, introductory slide to our topic today. This is the mitochondrion, plural mitochondria. The name comes from Carl Benda, a German scientist. And um, you can see that the mitochondrion looks a little bit like a sausage in this um, electron micrograph. It's the powerhouse of the cell because it's the cell's major producer of ATP, which is the cell's energy currency. And it's an organelle uh, that is bounded by two membranes, an inner membrane and an outer membrane, and has two compartments here, an inner membrane space and the matrix. And these convoluted inner membrane protrusions called cristae is where the action is for ATP synthesis. It's where the five complexes of the electron transport chain that carries out oxidative phosphorylation uh, is located. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today has to do with the origin and evolution of the eukaryotic cell. In other words, eukaryogenesis. How did all of the different eukaryotes that uh, we're familiar with, uh, how did they 
uh, originate and, and subsequently evolve? This is a major exciting question in biology right now. So we need to go back to the three tenets of cell theory. This theory was developed in the uh, last half of the 19th century. And it's attributed to three, again, three Germans, uh, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow. And the idea is that all living organisms are composed of uh, one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of structure and organization in organisms, and cells arise from pre-existing cells. Now, there are two basic types of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are cells before the development of a nucleus. The DNA is in the form of a, what we call a nucleoid in the sort of the cytosol or the, the cellular compartment within um, the prokaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, have a true nucleus. The DNA, the genome of the cell is encoded in a membrane. Uh, uh, encompassed in a membrane, and uh, that structure is called the nucleus. Also, there are three major types of cells, two prokaryotic types, bacteria, the ones that we're generally familiar with, also called eubacteria, and archaea, a more recently discovered group, discovered in the uh, lab of Carl Woese at the University of Illinois uh, in the 1970s. Uh, called archaea or archaeobacteria. And then we have eukaryotes. And uh, this tree, as uh, promulgated by Woes and collaborators, suggests that archaea, archaeobacteria, are the sister group to eukaryotes. They're more closely related to eukaryotes than are uh, bacteria. Now, the cell. The cell is defined by having a membrane, a phospholipid membrane. Many cells have a rigid cell wall. There are what we call organelles. These are specialized structures within the cell that are comparable to the organs within our bodies that carry out specialized tasks. There is the nucleus, of course, which is the defining feature of eukaryotic cells. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, vacuole, and two special or, uh, organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondrion in a plant cell. And these are special because they are the only two organelles that we know of that contain DNA. And that's a very important feature that will, will come into play as, as I go along. Now, it was in the 1960s that Lynn Margulis, she was Lynn Sagan at that time, married to Carl Sagan, the astronomer, uh, she gathered together um, various kinds of evidence, including this um, observation that organelles contain DNA, and wrote a seminal paper. Last year was the 50th anniversary of that paper. Uh, that suggested uh, that three fundamental organelles, the mitochondria, the photosynthetic plastids, and the basal bodies of flagella, were themselves once free-living prokaryotic cells. There's no evidence for that last suggestion, but she was right, as I will try and persuade you, uh, about mitochondria and uh, plastids. This was not a new hypothesis. This theory, this hypothesis, had uh, lain dormant for more than 50 years. It was, it was dismissed by the biologists in the early part of the 20th century as being sort of fairy tale. Uh, and nothing much was heard of it until Margulis basically re resurrected what was this moribund uh, hypothesis. So, again, I need to introduce a couple of terms. Symbiosis, the idea of two or more organisms that live closely together, and endosymbiosis, which is a symbiosis in which one of the partners lives within the other. 
and endosymbiosis is really what we're talking about here. So organelle evolution, as suggested by Margulis, was occurred in a serial fashion that a host that is still undefined, we don't really know whether this host had an, a nucleus or not, but it incorporated a particular type of bacterium called an alpha proteobacterium. So proteobacteria is one of the um, one of the phyla of bacteria, and within proteobacteria there are a number of divisions, and alpha proteobacteria is one of them, and that became the mitochondrion. A cell with the mitochondrion and a true nucleus then took up in a separate event a bacterium from a different bacterial phylum, cyanobacterium, and that became the plastid. So two events from two separate groups of eubacteria. Now in the 1970s there was a furious debate about whether this hypothesis, is, at least in the case of mitochondria, was true or not. And there were a number of investigators that were very much opposed to what Lynn Margulis was, uh, was proposing. And two of the most uh, ardent dissenters were Henry Mahler and Rudy Raff at the University of Indiana. So this was a contentious hypothesis, and it wasn't clear how one would actually be able to provide solid evidence that would um, decide between these two views. So at that time I was beginning a, my own research group, and I was beginning a, pro, a program to look at the mitochondrial nucleic acids, the DNA and the RNA within the mitochondria of plants, and we used wheat as our source material. And I thought that the ribosome might provide a way to get at this particular problem. So the ribosome uh, is a ribonucleoprotein particle, a particle made up of a few long RNA molecules and a large number of proteins, ribosomal proteins. Typically it's about two-thirds RNA and one-third protein. There are two separate <coughs> subunits a large and a small, and they come together in the process of protein biosynthesis. So it is, the ribosome is the cellular site of protein synthesis, an extraordinarily important uh, structure within the cell, and it's highly conserved both at the level of the ribosomal RNA and at the level of ribosomal proteins. So if we can determine the sequence of these molecules and compare them among different organisms, we have a very good way of trying to determine who's more closely related to whom and what the overall phylogenetic relationships among different groups is. Okay, so ribosomal RNA and the origin of mitochondria. Here's the idea. Mitochondria synthesize proteins. The mitochondrial protein synthesizing system, what we call translation, was known uh, by this time to display bacterial characteristics. For example, sensitivity to chloramphenicol and other antibiotics that are specifically targeted toward the bacterial ribosome, and also the use of N-formal methionyl tRNA, a special type of tRNA that uh, initiates protein synthesis in bacteria whereas uh, eukaryotes, the cytoplasmic protein synthesizing system, the main protein synthesizing system in the cell, uh, uses a, an unformulated methionine tRNA as initiator. And it was known that mitochondrial DNA encodes the ribosomal RNA components of this mitochondrial ribosome. So the idea, the question we asked is, are the mitochondrial RNA components are they bacterial in origin? 
Now, this was not an easy question to answer because even pretty early it was clear that <coughs> mitochondrial ribosomes differ in size from their bacterial counterparts. So, for example, the ribosomal RNAs in E. coli, typical bacterium, Escherichia coli, are 16S and 23S. S is the Svedberg unit. It is simply a measure, in this case, roughly of the size. The larger the S value, the, the, the larger the RNA. So 1,521 nucleotides in E. coli for the 16S ribosomal RNA, 2904 for the 23S ribosomal RNA. In contrast, mitochondrial ribosomes vary tremendously. So they're very small, 9S and 12S, in something like a trypanosome, the organism that causes African sleeping sickness, whereas um, they're 18S and 26S in plant mitochondria, almost the same size as the ribosomes, ribosomal RNAs of the cytosolic ribosome. So it wasn't immediately clear that we were going to get a clear answer out of this. However, we went about testing the uh, endosymbiont hypothesis by isolating viable wheat embryos, allowing them to germinate in a medium that contained radioactive phosphorus, P32 labeled uh, or inorganic orthophosphate, and we isolated and partially sequenced wheat mitochondrial SSU 18S rRNA. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of how we did this, but the end result was this paper. Uh, oh, I should say, too, that this was a joint collaboration between my lab, my first graduate student, Scott Cunningham, and Linda Bonin, who had come out of the Woes lab to become a research assistant in Fort Doolittle's lab. Uh, Ford joined the department a year after me, and then Linda came to my lab to be my second graduate student, so very, very incestuous here. <laughs> so we published this paper, and it provided the first solid molecular evidence demonstrating the prokaryotic nature of a mitochondrial ribosomal RNA, and we said these results argue in favor of an endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria. Now, remember, at this particular time, prokaryotic meant bacteria. The archaea hadn't been discovered yet. So we wanted to do, uh, go further than this and actually determine the entire sequence of the wheat mitochondrial 18S ribosomal RNA gene so that we could compare it with its bacterial counterpart. So this is the secondary structure of the 16S ribosomal RNA of E. coli, this 1,521 nucleotide molecule. And what you can do is you can fold this molecule up so that there are different parts of the molecule that base pair with one another. And they form these helical regions, as well as these long-range interactions between distant parts of the molecule that tie the molecule together. And this secondary structure turns out to be highly conserved, again, among bacteria. You can take any bacterial ribosomal RNA and it'll fit into this particular structure. Not completely identical, there are some regions that are a little more <coughs> variable than others, but basically this is the structure that you see. So two research assistants in the lab, David Spencer and Marie Schneer, cloned and sequenced the wheat mitochondrial small subunit ribosomal RNA gene, and with that sequence, they folded it up and asked, how does it compare to the E. coli sequence? And basically, you could map most of the structure, nucleotide for nucleotide, to the E. coli structure. It may be difficult to see, but there are a lot of black dots there. What that means is that there was the same nucleotide at that position in both the wheat sequence and the E. coli sequence. And the difference was these few regions called D regions, variable regions, that were quite variable in structure. And those are also variable among different bacterial small subunit ribosomal RNAs. And some of these are very large. This one is more than 300 uh, nucleotides longer 
then the same region in E. coli 16S ribosomal RNA. So that accounts for the difference in size. That's why this is an 18S looking RNA rather than a 16S RNA. But it is definitely no question that it is bacterial in origin. <coughs> now another thing we wanted to do after the Octea were discovered was to really ask the question, is it, is the prokaryotic origin eubacterial uh, or is it archaebacterial? Can we distinguish between these two possibilities? So um, what we set out to do, this, is a, this was a collaboration with um, colleagues at the University of Montreal, was to look at that central, highly conserved core that could be extracted from all ribosomal RNAs of the same type and aligned up and used that to generate phylogenetic trees. And this, was, this is a pretty trivial analysis by today's standards. There aren't very many taxa here, and the um, phylogenetic analysis should take just a few minutes uh, by today's, with today's computing power. But it was pretty novel in those days, and um, we had to use the computing power over several days, if not weeks, of the uh, supercomputer of the time at the Canadian Meteorological Service in Montreal to generate this tree. But what the tree did show was that clearly the mitochondrial sequences, wheat, yeast, and rat here, and a chloroplast sequence from euglena clearly went with the eubacterial counterpart from E. coli and not with an archaebacterial um, counterpart, halo uh, uh, bacterium here, or the, the yeast nucleus. Note, too, that the branch lengths here on the rat sequence and the yeast sequence, the mitochondrial sequences, are very long, which says that these sequences are diverging very rapidly, whereas the wheat sequence has a very short branch. And that was fortuitous. We luckily had picked the one mitochondrial system that is diverging so slowly that it retains very clear uh, bacterial ancestry in contrast <coughs> to either the wheat system or the rat system. Subsequently, Carl Woese used the wheat sequence to show in a phylogenetic tree with various types of bacteria that um, the wheat sequence was most closely related to that of agrobacterium. And agrobacterium belongs to the alpha subdivision of the so-called purple bacteria, which is alpha proteobacteria. And this was a very satisfying result, because 10 years earlier, two British scientists, John and Watley, had published a paper in Nature in which they had identified another bacterium called Paracoccus denitrificans as the bacterium that most resembles a mitochondrion in its respiratory chain and features of its <coughs> oxidative phosphorylation pathway. And it turns out that Paracoccus is an alpha proteobacterium. So at this particular time, um, I joined a, a group of other Canadian scientists who embarked on a program called the Organelle Genome Mega Sequencing Program. This was one of the very first large-scale um, sequencing programs in Canada. Again, uh, very trivial by today's standards, but in those days, this was at the beginning of the uh, sequencing revolution. And it turned out that the most difficult part of this project was not the sequencing, but actually culturing the organisms in order to get sufficient amounts of pure mitochondrial DNA to do the sequencing. But the end result was that we sequenced about um, three dozen uh, organelle uh, genomes. Now, I need to tell you about uh, human mitochondrial DNA as a basis for comparison. So the DNA in our cells 
is a fairly small molecule, only a little more than 16,000 nucleotides long. Circular mapping, it encodes 13 proteins, two ribosomal RNAs, and 22 tRNAs, just sufficient number of tRNAs to support mitochondrial translation in our mitochondria. Human mitochondrial DNA uh, encodes these 13 proteins, all of which are components of complexes that are associated with electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. So these are the mitochondrial DNA encoded ones in these five complexes. These are the total. And so mitochondrial DNA only encodes for 15 percent of the total proteins in these complexes. The other proteins are encoded by genes that are in the nuclear DNA, and the proteins are imported into the mitochondria. Okay, so one of the organisms that we chose to study was this one called Reclinomonas americana. It's um, a flagellated protozoan, it has two flagella. It uh, sort of resides, it reclines, that's the name Reclinomonas, in this kind of a shell, the lorica, that is attached by a stipe to whatever the, the, the bottom of whatever habitat the organism is living in. And it um, was initially described in only in 1993. It's a member of a group called Discoba within a supergroup, a eukaryotic supergroup called Excavata. And this includes um, euglenozoa, members of which are kinetoplastids like the trypanosomes, <laughs> diplonemas, and uh, euglenids like euglenogracilis. Um, we, um, this was Americana because it was isolated here in the U.S., and so uh, not to be offensive, but every now and then we call this sort of the American couch potato because of the fact <laughs> that it kind of sits back and, and waves its flagellum and tries to get bacteria that are close by. <laughs> anyway. When we isolated and sequenced the mitochondrial DNA, we got a very surprising result and a very exciting one, because it, uh, this, is, this is where it is. The, the core Jacobas are uh, within this group of excavata. This is us down here, animals with our closest living relatives are the fungi. <laughs> and when we sequenced the mitochondrial DNA of Reclinomonas, it was amazing because it turns out to be four times as large as human mitochondrial DNA. It has five times as many proteins. It's a circular mapping G DNA, just like a bacterial genome, packed with genes, very little intergenic spacer. It looks, for all intents and purposes, like a miniature eubacterial genome. It has um, genes that are present in other mitochondrial DNAs. In fact, it has all of the genes that were present in, in all of the mitochondrial DNAs that had been characterized up to that point. Um, genes like ribosomal proteins were arranged in what looked like bacterial type operons. And it also had 20 genes that had never been found in mitochondrial DNA uh, before. And it's interesting to look at this as sort of the largest, most gene-rich, most bacteria-like mitochondrial DNA that we know of. And at the other end of the spectrum is the 6,000 base pair mitochondrial DNA in the plasmodium, which is the malaria parasite. And it only encodes three proteins and two ribosomal RNAs. And the ribosomal RNA genes are chopped up into pieces, and the pieces are interspersed with one another. And they, um, the gene pieces are transcribed as separate small RNAs that come together um, through intermolecular interactions to reconstitute this secondary structure. Okay, so um, all of the uh, genomes that have been sequenced in, uh, within this Jacobid group, there are half a dozen or more now, all have this uh, same type of structure very gene-rich, and the current champion is this guy called Andalusia Godoy. It was isolated by uh, Alastair Simpson, uh, who's in the biology department at Dalhousie. 
And uh, it, it lacks one of the genes in Reclinomonas mitochondrial DNA, but has two additional protein coding genes and three additional tRNA genes. So we can say that the Jacobas within this supergroup Excavata have the most gene-rich and most bacteria-like mitochondrial genomes characterized to date, and that the last eukaryotic common ancestor that we call LECA had a mitochondrial genome that most closely resembled ancestral protist mitochondrial DNAs, such as those found in the Jacobids. And through these comparative studies that we and others uh, did of mitochondrial genomes across the spectrum, particularly of eukaryotic microbes, the protists, we can make a number of deductions about the evolution of mitochondria. First of all, we can say that mitochondria are monophyletic because the gene content tells us so. So this Venn diagram shows the outer blue line encompasses all of the genes that we found in Reclinomonas mitochondrial DNA, and the inner colored lines are the different subsets that are found in other mitochondrial DNAs in other organisms. And the argument here is that if we started out with a very large bacteria-like genome, a lot of the genes must have been lost and tailored down to this very small set, and it's very improbable that this could have happened independently to get down to what is basically a set or a subset of the same um, genes. We can also see this uh, monophyly from gene order. So as I said, the, those, the genomes, like Reclinomonas, that encode ribosomal protein genes, have them organized in operons, bacteria-like operons, and if you line them up, what you see is although the order is the same, there are a number of genes that are missing from the mitochondrial operons. For example, here, 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 here. And so again, the argument is that it's unlikely that all of these different losses occurred independently to give you a convergently similar um, pattern that in fact these losses must have occurred already in the, common an the last common ancestor of uh, these particular uh, mitochondria. And finally, if we make a, a tree, a phylogenetic tree based on small subunit ri uh, ribosomal RNA sequences, the mitochondria come out as a monophyletic group. That is, they all cluster together to the exclusion of their closest bacterial relatives, which in these, uh, this particular tree are the rickettsias, the rickettsiales, including rickettsia proezeki, which is the uh, causative agent of um, typhus, uh, and rickettsia rickettsii, which is the causative agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The one thing we can't say is where exactly within the, the alpha proteobacteria mitochondria originate. Uh, some people have them coming from within the Rickettsiales, some as sisters to the Rickettsiales, some as sisters to non Rickettsiales alpha proteobacteria, and very recently, earlier this year, uh, this group presented evidence that um, the um, mitochondria originated outside of alpha proteobacteria altogether. That is, that mitochondria and alpha proteobacteria uh, shared a common ancestor, and that mitochondria split off from that common ancestor before alpha proteobacteria started to diverge into its various uh, subcomponents. Okay, so we've uh, talked about the mitochondrial DNA and how strongly that has pointed towards an alpha proteobacterial origin of mitochondria, or at least the mitochondrial genome. What about the mitochondrial proteome? The mitochondrial proteome is the collection of all of the proteins <laughs> that make up the mitochondria. What does it have to say about the origin and evolution of mitochondria? Well, uh, naively, I certainly thought that um, 
if the mitochondrial genome came from an alpha proteobacterium, a majority of the mitochondrial proteins were likely to be alpha proteobacterial too, and that turned out to be very naive and incorrect. <laughs> uh, but let me remind you again that the, the proteins that are encoded in mitochondrial DNA, for example, in humans here, uh, is a very small proportion of the total proteome. So only 13 of the mitochondrial proteins are encoded in the mitochondrial genome in humans, and the rest are encoded by genes that are in the nucleus, many of which, or majority of which, we would have presumed would have been in the original alpha proteobacterial endosymbion and moved into the nucleus in the course of evolution. But it turns out that's not correct. In fact, only a small proportion of the mitochondrial proteome, 10 to 20 percent, can be confidently traced to alpha proteobacteria. And from a phylogenetic perspective, then, the mitochondrial proteome appears to be an evolutionary mosaic. And the sort of pattern that you see, uh, several dozen proteomes have been looked at up to this point, and the pattern is always the same. You see a small chunk that's alpha proteobacterial, either because these are genes that are still in the mitochondrial genome, or they've been moved into the nuclear genome. There's another larger chunk that's prokaryotic-like. It's bacterial or archaeal, but not associated strongly with any particular bacterial or archaeal group. There's another large chunk that's eukaryote-like, no bacterial counterparts. These appear to be inventions within the eukaryotic cell uh, during the evolutionary transition from endosymbiont to organelle. And then a very puzzling chunk, it can be quite large in some of these cases, of proteins that are unique to that particular organism. They're mitochondrial, for sure, but they have no counterparts by sequence that we can detect outside of that particular species or very closely related species. So the best we can say, and it's not very satisfactory, is that the evolutionary origin of the major part of the mitochondrial proteome is still obscure, I would say, but I would hazard a a, 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 um, a guess that a large part may have already been present in the host cell and then used to, um, in the transition from uh, endosymbiont to organelle. And the reason I say that is a very recent study from um, Tony Gabaldon's lab in which they present evidence that the protein families of alpha proteobacterial ancestry and mitochondrial localization, that's these proteins here, have the shortest phylogenetic distances to their closest prokaryotic relatives compared to non-alpha proteobacterial proteins. And they suggest that this uh, reflects a late acquisition of mitochondria by a host that already had a chimeric um, prokaryotic ancestry. One final point is that comparative genomics, comparing all of these genomes that have been sequenced, tells us another important uh, lesson, and that is that the last eukaryotic common ancestor we, we call LECA, that's the ancestor from which all extant eukaryotes have evolved, already had a mitochondrion whose proteome and metabolic functions were as complex as that of a contemporary mitochondrion. So whatever the transition from organelle to fully-fledged mitochondrion was, it was already completed by the time of the last eukaryotic common ancestor. So you may ask, how did it happen? Well, there are um, probably as many specific models of how mitochondria evolved, as there are those of us who are working in the field. But they all sort of divide down into sort of two basic groups that I've summarized here. One is the idea of uh, 
that mitochondria uh, arose or arrived fairly late in the evolution of the eukaryotic cell. The other one, that mitochondria were early. And the idea here for mitochondria late ones, this is sort of the more conventional uh, view of how mitochondria arose, was that there was a, some sort of proto-eukaryote, which already had a lot of eukaryotic character to it, maybe a nucleus, maybe not, uh, took up a bacterium that became the eukaryote. But a lot of the eukaryotic characteristics were already in place. Mitochondria early uh, models show or suggest that uh, an archaean acted as host to a bacterium, somehow took it up, and converted it into a mitochondrion. And it was this early acquisition and conversion into the mitochondrion that actually led to the origin of the eukaryotic cell as we know it, led to the uh, emergence of all these other characteristics. And the idea here is that this is, based on, this is based on phagotrophy, the idea that you can take in an organism, the ability to engulf another organism. This uh, mito early models are based on syntrophy, metabolic syntrophy. That is that these two are very, very closely linked metabolically. And you may be familiar, some of you, with this hypothesis. This is probably the best known of the mitochondria early hypotheses, the uh, hydrogen hypothesis by um, Bill Martin and Miklos Mueller. And the idea here is that there were two closely linked organisms, an archaean that produced methane and a bacterium that produced hydrogen. And these were required by the other partner. And at some point, the bacterium became incorporated and led to the uh, formation of the eukaryote. Now, when this was first reported, I called it an elegant hypothesis, and I still think it is, but I'm not so sure it's correct. Um, <laughs> I have a number of problems with this hypothesis, and I'll just note two here. How would the uptake of a bacterium by an archaean have occurred? So this is a problem in cell biology, not phylogenetics or any other type of approach. These two partners presumably had cell walls, and particular if the archaean had a cell wall, how would that have taken up another um, organism, another bacterium that had a cell wall? And also, although there are numerous examples of uh, phagocytic endosymbionts among eukaryotes, there are no known examples that I'm aware of of a bacterial symbiont within an archaeal host. And then what about this mosaic, predominantly non-alpha proteobacterial character of the mitochondrial proteome? Mitochondrial early um, theories, in my view, suggest that the largest proportion of bacterial type proteins within a eukaryote should be alpha proteobacterial in nature because they come from this very early endosymbiont, and that simply is not the case. Now recently there are two uh, developments that are, uh, I think, r really interesting. One is this um, studies that have come out of Thies Etma's lab in Uppsala in Sweden, where they have identified a group of marine archaea from uh, deep hydrothermal vents, which they have named after the various Norse gods. And they, this whole group is called the Asgard group. And um, their particular analyses show eukaryotes as being coming out within this particular phylogenetic group. And moreover, what's particularly interesting is that if you look at what genes are encoded by these Asgard archaea, there are a lot of genes that were previously thought to be ESPs, eukaryotic specific proteins. Uh, and a lot of these are proteins that would have been necessary for the development of phagocytosis, phagotrophy. And so um, this group has put forward 
a hypothesis. Those of you who are familiar with the TV series uh, Stargate will know who this character is. So the idea here, according to them, is that an Ars Asgard Archaean would have lost the cell wall, and um, that would have allowed the development of an actin-based cytoskeleton, and phagocytosis could then have taken place with uptake of, of diverse bacteria uh, and uh, gene flow from the genomes of the, those bacteria into the nucleus of this um, cell leading to a para-karyotic <coughs> host cell with a, a nucleus. And at that point, phagocytosis of an alpha proteobacterium that would then transition from endosymbiont to energy-generating organelle. And in my view, this, this to me is, is the most appealing hypothesis or hypothesis of those that are floating around out there and that best accommodates the data. So I want to end by just going through what we know, what we infer, and what we don't know about this, because I think it's important to distinguish between facts and what we can infer from those facts and what is still speculation. So what do we know? Well, we know that the mitochondrial genome is a stripped-down bacterial genome. Mitochondria share a specific common ancestor with alpha proteobacteria. The mitochondria of all eukaryotes descend from a common ancestor. Mitochondria are monophyletic. LECA, the last eukaryotic common ancestor, had a fully functional mitochondrion. The mitochondrial proteome is a mosaic of proteins having diverse evolutionary origins, and that attests to a very complex uh, transition from endosymbiont to organelle. And proteins of clear alpha proteobacterial origin comprise just a small minority of the mitochondrial proteome. What do we infer from these data? Well, we infer that an alpha proteobacterial endosymbiosis best explains mitochondrial origin. I think we can certainly go with that. There has obviously been radical restructuring that occurred during symbiont to organelle transition. For one thing, there must have been loss of the bacterial cell wall, but retention of the inner and outer membranes of the alpha proteobacterium. There must have been massive gene loss. There was obviously a lot of duplication between functions in the endosymbiont and functions in the, in the host cell. And, as well, a lot of relocation of genes from the endosymbiont to the nucleus through what we call endosymbiotic gene transfer. And we know this occurs because there are some genes, for example, that are present in reclinomonas mitochondrial DNA that are clearly present in the nuclear DNA in other um, eukaryotes, and these are clearly what we call orthologs of, of the mitochondrial genes. And there must have been acquisition <coughs> of proteins having diverse evolutionary origins. Now, what we don't know, and it's a long list, <laughs> and I, I throw it out to you because I want you to believe that this is not a settled issue by any matter or means. So we don't know the precise relationship between mitochondria and alpha proteobacteria. Did mitochondria had <coughs> Alpha proteobacteria already diverged into its various divisions, and mitochondria came from one of those, or is it a sister lineage, or mitochondria sister lineage to alpha proteobacteria, which would have pushed the origin back before the diversification of the alpha proteobacteria? We don't know when it happened. I would assert we don't know whether it happened early or late in eukaryogenesis. We speculate. We don't know the basis of the endosymbiosis. We don't know if it was syntrophy or phagocytosis or what. We have our prejudices about which we think is more reasonable. We don't know how and over what time period the symbiont to organelle transition occurred. We think mitochondria originated one billion or so years ago, 
but it's just a guess and we don't know how long the transition was from the first mitochondrial common ancestor, would have, which would have been that uh, endo, first endosymbiotic event, to the last mitochondrial common ancestor. We don't know where the bulk of the mitochondrial proteome came from, and we don't know why the mitochondrial genome and proteome are so extraordinarily variable in different eukaryotes. There is a tremendous amount of flexibility in mitochondria as to how they organize the genes that they contain, what genes they contain, how they are expressed, and the proteins that make up their, um, constitute the organelle. So I'll leave you with a couple of quotes from a recent um, article, uh, review article that I wrote. The mitochondrial data, drawn in large part from analyses of mitochondrial DNA and the genes it contains, leave little doubt that bacterial endosymbiosis played a crucial role in the origin of mitochondria, although I personally would contend that the role is considerably more circumscribed than we initially imagined. It was the mitochondrial genome, it was the mitochondrial inner and outer membranes, and it was a small number of proteins. Everything else came from somewhere else. And again, thinking about how science historically evolves, I thought it was worth contemplating how different the historical record of our views about mitochondrial origin and evolution might have been had our detailed knowledge and understanding of the mitochondrial proteome de predated that of the mitochondrial genome. What if we had known all about the mitochondrial proteome before we knew about the mitochondrial DNA? Would we have been so quick to invoke a bacterial endosymbiosis uh, as leading to mitochondria? And with that, I thank you for your attention. And these are the sources of my uh, support over my career. Thank you very much. Okay, the question is, what is the difference between RNA and DNA? Okay, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So um, nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides, which is a base, which is the, th the four letters, adenine, cytosine, guanine. And in DNA, it is, instead of, uh, it, it is, is a base called thymine, okay? And the sugar component, so there's a base and a sugar component, the sugar component is 2-deoxyribose, so the 2 position does not have anything other than a, a hydrogen atom, okay? In the case of RNA, it's ribonucleic acid, and the sugar is 2-deoxyribose, two two so there's a hydroxyl group at the 2 position. And that difference, a hydroxyl group versus a hydrogen, makes a big difference in the chemistry of the molecule. And in addition to that, RNA, instead of having thymine, has a base called uracil. And thymine is 5-methyluracil. So in DNA, it's like uracil, but it has a methyl group on it. And so it's those two differences, a methyl group in one of the bases, and whether or not you have a hydrogen or a hydroxyl group in the sugar at the two position. That's the difference. Yes? I'm not an expert in it, but as I understand, they used mitochondrial DNA at one point to propose the amount of ancestral um, genetics that were um, apparent in Africa for the beginning of um, human beings. And I'm just curious if they can backtrack using mitochondrial DNA for something like that, um, can we backtrack to approximately how far back, you know, the um, eukaryotic mitochondrial DNA, you know, existed, looking at the changes in the um, RNA? Yeah, the real problem was trying to use um, sequences as uh, to, to date is that you really need some way to relate them to a kind of a fossil record where we can determine actual absolute dates. 
You're right that mitochondrial DNA has been very useful in actually tracing uh, human populations and the fact that humans basically originated out of Africa and then populated throughout the world. But uh, we can make some guesses as to how far back that might have been, but that's based on the fossil record that we have of, of human fossils. Okay, we have, to, we have to do it. And the fact is that sequences are not uh, perfect molecular chronometers. They don't change, sequence change does not occur uniformly over time in different lineages. You saw that in the mitochondrial ribosomal RNAs, that the, 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 the small subunit ribosomal RNA in something like rat and yeast evolves or changes in sequence much more rapidly than that in a plant like wheat. So because of these, you get into all sorts of difficulties trying to relate sequence information to absolute time. Funny you should ask that question, because <laughs> there was a paper recently in which a group uh, took yeast and were able to insert E. coli into it. And the idea there, at least one of the ideas, is could you, could you recapitulate endosymbiosis? Unfortunately, I haven't been able to read that paper yet <laughs> because I was busy uh, preparing this lecture. <laughs> But yeah, people are thinking about doing this sort of thing. And so given the advances that we're seeing in genetic manipulation, I wouldn't be surprised that there are going to be some really interesting and really surprising studies to come out of this sort of approach. Then you can see how the genetic, or genetic material was transferred if it was viable, yeah. and whether it happened quickly or over a long time. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that was, uh, one of the observations that was made a number of years ago by Jeff Schatz's lab in Switzerland was they asked, you know, how easy is it to get a mitochondrial targeting sequence onto a gene that's being transferred into the nucleus? Because remember, if you're taking a protein or coding, protein coding gene from, like, from the mitochondrion or the endosymbiont, transferring it to the nucleus, it has to be activated in the nucleus so that it's transcribed, and the messenger RNA has to be tr transported to the cytoplasm where it's translated. And in order to import proteins, or a large proportion of proteins into the mitochondrion, there's a sequence at the end terminus that has to be there, a mitochondrial targeting sequence. And so what they did was they made a construct that had a reporter gene, and they just took pieces of E. coli DNA at that time and fused it onto the five prime end of this reporter gene and asked how frequently is the protein that's made transferred into the mitochondrion. And it was a surprisingly large per percentage. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it was much more than you would have imagined. And that says that creating a mitochondrial targeting sequence is not that big a deal. And that means that transferring genes into the nucleus and getting them back into the mitochondrion wouldn't have been an insurmountable uh, issue in this endosymbiont to organelle transition. Yes? As far as we know, it's only mitochondrion plastids. Now, plastids, there is, uh, there's an interesting twist because, like mitochondria, they had a single origin, okay? So the plastid only originated once. 
within a group called Archeplastida, which encompasses land plants and uh, chlorophyte algae, um, red algae, and glaucocystified algae. Okay? But there have been transfers secondarily of the plastid by non-photosynthetic eukaryotes taking up a photosynthetic eukaryote. Okay, so it's a eukaryotic endosymbiont rather than a prokaryotic one. And in most cases, everything except the plastid has been eliminated of, of the endosymbiont. So all you have are extra membranes around the plastid that are the original membranes of the, of the, of the host cell. But there are a couple of cases, a couple of lineages called uh, chlorarachnophytes and cryptophytes where there's actually a remnant nucleus called a nucleomorph that still has a little bit of the original nuclear DNA of the endosymbiont as well as the plastid. And so we can tell in that case where the endosymbiont came from, which eukaryotic group it came from. And so with plastids, um, the whole concept of endosymbiosis and secondary acquisition has been much easier for people to swallow because the data are so much um, clearer than they are with mitochondria where mitochondrial genomes are so diverse and so rapidly evolving in many lineages. It's been a much harder problem to solve. Let me ask one last question in the back and I'll remind people that there is a reception on this so you can come and talk to Mike and there is one student that has a question on the left. Yeah, hi. Um, so you had one of your, almost your last slides, you had a, uh, it was like a, uh, an archaea with no cell wall and an active cytoskeleton that was capable of uh, taking in the symbiote. Yes. And it's my understanding only eukarya have active for their cytoskeleton. So right. are you saying that there was some sort of proto-eukarya that was different than archaea and bacteria that participated in this? Yes, that's the implication of the ECMA results, that these Asgard archaea have proteins that were, they encode proteins that were previously thought to be only found in eukaryotes. And some of those proteins are proteins that are required for, would have been required for the evolution of the, uh, of phagocytosis. And so it's an evolving archaea, Asgard archaean, if you will, that's lost the cell wall but developed a, an actin cytoskeleton. So it's a transitional stage, if you will. Yeah. Okay, so with that, thank you.